The session will be divided in two parts. In the first part, uh, the four speakers will give their paper in 15 minutes. I'm Swiss. 15 minutes is not 25. It's, it's 15. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> and during the, the second part, it is clear that the floor will be open and the audience will have the opportunity to ask questions, make remarks, and, and so on. That we will have, I hope, an interactive uh, session. And during the question time, the speakers will have the opportunity, of course, to add some remarks to their previous uh, talk. Uh, in order to have a kind of coherence of the session, each speaker has been kindly invited to stress the relationships between history, memory, and politics in the framework of humanities. And enough contemporary issues, uh, sorry, enough contemporary or historical example could underline how the confusion between these three fields has led to nationalist, ethnocentric, or racist drifts. Uh, which are not only source of misunderstanding, but also source of permanent and periodical conflict. And question has been addressed to the speaker, how can a better clarification of this relationship contribute to highlight the humanities? Does a lack of clarification trigger a weakening of the role of the humanities in tackling contemporary issues as, such as educational, cultural, political, institutional, or legal ones. And it is based on their scientific and personal knowledge and their own example from their domain of expertise that the speakers are invited to show how they tackle this issue and the meaning of it when defending the humanities. And I have the pleasure to invite here to introduce the first speaker. Catherine Jamy is a senior researcher at the French National de la Recherche Scientifique and works at uh, the Joint CNRS uh, SS unit China, Korea, Japan, and a history of science. She has published extensively on mathematics in 17th and 18th century China, as well as on the Jesuit missionaries and the reception of the sciences they introduced to late Ming and early Qing China. And recently, she has authored the Emperor's New Mathematic, Western Learning, and Imperial Authority during the Kangxi reign. I think I'm correct, I hope. Yes, so, Catherine, you have the floor. Please, come. You have your... Well, first of all, I would like to thank everyone who at UNESCO at Sipchen in Liège has made this meeting possible. Um, it, it is uh, for me a very rare privilege to be able to share some thoughts on the topic of history, memory, and politics to do with uh, my research experience and my field. So you are warned, this is going to be about the memory and history of science and knowledge. Um, and I would like to start with a question that is just really a provocation. Who does al-Khawarizmi belong to? Now, if some of you think they have never heard the name al-Khawarizmi, all of you know about the word algorithm, which in all uh, Western European languages derives from the name of this uh, scholar. And you all know the word, word algebra, which uh, stems from the title of his most famous book. Um, if one looks... Um, 
for memory and national memories, I find that stamp collection is a very good place to start. Uh, who in the past has put Al Khawarizmi on its stamps? I have um, found two. The first one on the, um, on the left was uh, issued in the Soviet Union in 1989 to celebrate the 1200th anniversary of Al Khawarizmi. His date of birth is not very precisely known. And more recently, um, Uzbekistan in uh, 2014 has also uh, issued a stamp. Indeed, as his name indicates, uh, Al Khawarizmi was born in the region of Khwarezm, which is in today's Uzbekistan. So, yeah, you could say he, he belongs to Uzbekistan. But when you add to this that he died in Baghdad, that he was from a Persian family, and that one of the uh, mathematical methods he promoted was something he called Indian calculation, you begin to realize that there is, at the very least, uh, multiple ownership there. And more generally then, the question is, um, does knowledge belong to someone or does uh, knowledge belong somewhere? How much sense does it make to talk about Greek science or Chinese medicine Indian mathematics, Islamic astronomy, or European philosophy. To, 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 uh, you, to, to, to place here just a few of these phrases that one hears all the time and um, uses without much thought. Are they useful? Are they harmful? Are they misleading? What, what, what do we do with these? Um, when one thinks of the memory of the sciences, uh, I would say it's the same old story, and I have heard it told yesterday, or part of it. One starts in ancient Mesopotamia, and obviously then one goes on to ancient Greece. Um, some of the story go through Islam. There are still some deniers, people who say, no, Islam was not important, not essential in the transmission of ancient uh, science. Um, then it goes on to Europe, and from Europe, it spreads worldwide, and this is what we know as the glorious modern universal science. So this is the, uh, I would say, the dominant narrative. Uh, and as such, it suggests that science, being the place of science, is part of Europe's uh, constructed memory and part of its identity, right? We, here in Europe, are the place where science somehow originated, grew, and from there it spread all over the world. Um, so maybe the historian's task is to uh, question this, this collective memory. And because of world history, this collective memory has long been also accepted uh, around the world. We talk about the West and the rest. Well, the rest has long assumed that Europe claimed a monopoly on science. And um, to try and show how these things can happen, uh, I would like to talk about uh, how knowledge that comes from outside can be appropriated. Appropriation is a very important notion. It has been mentioned here yesterday that a book is nothing if it is not read. Well, knowledge does not exist out there. Either we make it ours or it, it simply doesn't exist. We know of traditions that die out, so knowledge has to be alive, it has to be transmitted, shared, and as we do this, we always reshape it. And I will give you an example from uh, one other, the, the, the part and um, the place and time in the world I have been working on for some time, and that is early modern uh, China, 17th century. Um, the first thing I want to state here, all of you know it, but it's very important for my story, China was never a Western colony. This means that the question of who could reside in China was ultimately up to the Chinese civil service, extremely well organized, and if things had to move that far up, to the emperor. So residing in China was not to be taken for granted, and also to decide what was going to be taught at school, what was to be on the examination curriculum, 
uh, we're talking here about imperial China, right? Not of the 20th century. This was also an imperial decision and outsiders could be there as long as they respected this and accommodated. Um, this being said, the presence of Jesuit missionaries in China is of course part of um, European overseas expansion in the 17th century. To be more precise, the first Jesuit missionaries came on Portuguese ships and transited uh, via Macau where they had to stay until they were granted permission to enter China. Be that as it may, by 1645, the new uh, dynasty reigning in China, the Manchu Qing dynasty, promulgated a new calendar. And this new calendar, which with a couple of years exception, lasted until the end of the imperial age, was calculating, calculated according to Western method. And here I just translate a Chinese term that was used at the time, Western method. Um, this, of course, raised major issues and there were controversies. Um, the question that Chinese literati asked was, can one entrust astronomy to outsider who do not understand its fundamental function? What was the fundamental function of astronomy uh, in imperial China? Well, the, the astronomy and the calendar that were a monopoly of the emperor were the means by which the human realm uh, was made to uh, work in rhythm that were in harmony with those of the cosmos. For example, when was the winter solstice? This was the day when the emperor must accomplish certain rites in order to ensure a good harvest for a, the following year. So clearly the Jesuits dismissed all these rituals as superstition, so the Chinese scholars were right to say they really don't understand. So was it safe to and, and, and appropriate for these barbarians, according, uh, admittedly peaceful, but these barbarians to be in charge of such an important thing as the calendar? There were two types of answers to this question. Um, the first one, and is the, is the earliest one, but it's also the one that was the minority, is a form of universalism. The symbol claimed that numbers and principles are the same in China, in the West, and everywhere in the world. So yes, this is what we call universe, the universal validity of scientific knowledge. But a more uh, a widespread um, reaction was to uh, look for precedents and say, well, this knowledge, it may now come from abroad, but in fact, we've always had it. And Chinese uh, scholars versed in astronomy reread uh, Chinese classics in astronomy and interpreted them not according to earlier commentaries but in ways that made them compatible with Western uh, ideas. And then closer to them they found historical evidence that notions such as the sphericity of the earth were already present in China. Indeed they were already present in China because in the 13th century the Mongols uh, made uh, a number of Persian astronomers uh, go to China and work there. So we are back, in a sense, to al-Khawarizmi. Yes, the ideas that Europeans claim were theirs and linked to Christianity had already arrived in China with uh, earlier Mus uh, Muslim astronomer a few centuries ago. So uh, in, in these methods, there was a mix of what today's historian recognized as validly evidence and what uh, we now dismiss as not um, uh, verified by uh, historical evidence. So this idea of the Chinese origin of Western learning turned what was potentially a threat to established learning into first a tool for retrieving antiquity um, and secondly uh, elements that reinforced established knowledge. Now, what is interesting is that in the 20th century, uh, there was a very vocal advocate of this notion that Chinese uh, Western knowledge uh, originated in China. And this was Joseph Needham. And I think I will say a few words of Joseph Needham. 
besides being a biochemist and the founder of the historical study of the uh, scientific and technical tradition of China, Joseph Needham is also known as the man who put an S into UNESCO. He was a colleague and friend of Julian Huxley, the first general director of UNESCO, and he was also the first director of the science section of UNESCO. And it, the story goes that it was him who told Huxley, you do not want to found UNECO, you want to find UNESCO. And for us who are uh, here, gather here today to uh, discuss, promote the humanities, I think we have to remember that the humanities, that science, culture, and education will fight and live together and not separately. So I, I would say here, science is not an enemy or a competitor of, of the humanities. It's all part of uh, human knowledge. Joseph Needham started from um, uh, um, something that Francis Bacon wrote in 1614, and here I quote, it is well to observe the force and virtue and consequences of discoveries, namely printing the compass and gunpowder, for these have changed the whole state and face of things without the world, throughout the world, sorry, the first in literature, the second in navigation, and the third in warfare. And uh, Bacon goes on to say, well, these are of obscure origin. What Joseph Needham did was to prove that these three inventions and many others were actually um, the first uh, discovered in China and from there went transmitted to Europe. Um, so um, to give you an idea of his major work, Science and Civilization in China, that's to date 24 massive volumes, uh, Needham's enterprise was, as he phrased it, a enterprise of titration. Titration is a chemical process by which given a solution, you don't know what's in there, you um, perform certain tests on samples of it to establish what concentration of various elements is in this solution. So the, the, if our solution is global universal science, the question is how, many, uh, how much Chinese contribution is there to this solution? And that was the spirit in which uh, Joseph Needham worked. Um, so since there, there is no question that China has a scientific and a technical tradition. And I think it's a good example that proves that where people think that there is no scientific and uh, technical knowledge that is rooted locally, it's just because we haven't looked. And there are still many, many uh, parts of the world, I would say, for which we need to bring to light how much they have contributed. So, a few words in conclusion. Um, what I have tried to say here is that historians and history sometimes have to work against memory. And I think it's an essential task of the historian. Needham has established historical facts. He has documented the fact that printing was present in China several centuries before it was in Europe, and so on and so forth. And this is uh, establishing such, such facts is not about narrative. It is about what we can and should base uh, ourselves on to work. I would say further that his historical investigation has challenged Europe's invented memory as the source of all scientific knowledge. It is no longer possible to sustain such an idea, even is if as some uh, scholars of, of, uh, who study uh, scientific texts in Arabic and Persian, one basically says that one has to enlarge this entity uh, to include all this, um, all this corpus written in these languages. This does not suffice to, uh, for us to understand where these greatly complex forms of knowledge and practice uh, that today belong to everybody, uh, how they came about and how they came to be merged, circulated, and transformed to take the forms that we now know today. So, yes, I would say that as we stand here today, one of the tasks of the historians, and in this case the historians of science, is to deconstruct memory and its political uses. And 
uh, here, as, uh, as in the case of science and in the case of knowledge, I think they form a very important part of imagined identities. And we must do this because our job is to retrieve complexity. A history of the world is not just one narrative, and as it has to encompass the whole of a chronology that we can grasp, so it has to encompass all the traces of uh, human activity around the world where we can trace it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Catherine, for respecting the rules. Uh, I forgot to introduce myself, I'm sorry. It's, uh, but, uh, proof of modesty. I'm Laurent Tissot, I'm Professor of Contemporary History at the University of Neuchâtel in Switzerland, and I am the current treasurer of the International Committee of Historical Sciences, which is a member of SIPSH. Now, I have the pleasure to introduce Chris Carré, uh, who is Emeritus Professor of Greek at University College London. He had worked at universities in the UK and the United States, and given courses in the Netherlands, Hungary, Greece, and Serbia. And his research interests include Greek oratory, law, tragedy, and comedy, historiography, and lyric poetry. So you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction, Professor T. So, <clears throat> Uh, can I just check, does everyone have a copy of the handout? I think the answer is no, is it? No. <coughs> don't worry if you don't have a copy of the handout, it's simply there to allow you to test if I'm telling the truth uh, against the, uh, the evidence. Uh, I'd like to echo um, Professor Jami's thanks to the uh, organizers of the conference and to our hosts here in Liège for um, such a splendid setting and to Professor Tiso for, um, uh, for chairing this, this panel. <coughs> Nobody is going to hang you uh, in a humanities uh, panel for claiming that a knowledge of history has value, even if, and I come back to this later, one is forced to ask, whose history? <clears throat> the examples I want to give you come from a world separated by, uh, from us by millennia, but in many respects so, so close that you could almost reach out and touch it. Uh, in the past, in fact, you could touch it quite literally, not just through monuments and imitations across the whole culture, but also uh, in politics. A century and a half ago, my discipline, the culture of Greece and Rome, formed the basis of an education system which equipped young men, uh, and it was always young men, uh, to go out uh, and rule an empire. The empire is long gone, and the question is often asked, what is the point of classics? Two weeks ago, a university vice chancellor wrote to me suggesting that the subject was in terminal decline. Uh, and uh, several times a year, uh, FIEC has to intervene uh, to contest attempts to close departments. But there are actually more people studying the culture of Greece and Rome now than at almost any time in the past. And the relevance of the culture, or indeed any culture whose history we study, remains. I want to take a couple of examples deliberately chosen for today's theme. Um, what I want to talk about, in fact, is forgetting. Uh, and obviously, uh, forgetting is an important part of memory. We need to forget simply in order to uh, manage the vast amount of information in our lives. But communities, too, uh, need to, or often choose to, forget. And I start with one of the most famous examples in the history of the Athenian democracy, and that is text one on your handout. It's the amnesty which ended the civil war in Athens in 403 BC. In 404 BC, Athens, under pressure from Sparta, 
voted into power a junta of 30 men. This group was known collectively as the 30. Moderns tend to call them the 30 tyrants, but the Athenians always just called them the 30. And they instituted a reign of terror, which lasted a year. Uh, in this reign of terror, the mass of the population uh, were barred from the city. They were deprived of political power. Property was systematically plundered and the later estimate was that up to 1,500 citizens, at least 5% of the adult male population of Athens, was executed, uh, usually without trial or with some sort of rigged trial. <coughs> Democracy was only restored by force, by a pitched battle. And inevitably, there was a lasting bitterness, not just against the ringleaders, but against the people who, in one way or another, had collaborated with the regime. The situation is a familiar one, familiar from many parts of Europe after World War II, from South Africa after the end of apartheid, from the Balkans after the wars following the disintegration of Yugoslavia, from Northern Ireland uh, after the peace agreement uh, between the, uh, uh, the warring groups. The Athenians were faced with a problem. How do you reconstitute a fractured community? How do the victims of abuse live alongside those who have orchestrated or collaborated in this abuse? As part of the process of negotiating peace, the Athenians agreed an amnesty. Actually, the word uh, uh, in Greek uh, they used was not amnesty because the Greeks were not yet using it. Uh, amnesty, of course, is forgetting the standard language they use is not remembering harm done or wrongs done. But even this is too precise because the Greek word is ambiguous. It can mean not mention, not remind people. So they know that this is not really forgetting at all. It's about creating barriers to public recollection. It's about collective falsification, as it were, of memory about not bringing legal action or taking physical revenge for the immediate past, whatever one may feel. There had to be exceptions, including the ringleaders of the coup, but even they could claim the amnesty if they were prepared to submit to an audit of their conduct and retrospectively legitimize their actions. The other uh, exclusion from the amnesty were people who had killed with their own hands because uh, homicide in the ancient world pollutes. This was nothing new in the Greek world. If you look at text six, I give you an example from about 20 years before, where the Athenians concluded a similar amnesty uh, uh, in a treaty with a rebel city uh, in the north. And the practice was equally common across the Greek world. Text seven on your handout gives an instance from the city of Megara in uh, central Greece uh, after um, uh, factional fighting. If you look at text seven, you'll see that not all the amnesties worked. As can be seen here, uh, the party with the upper hand immediately turn on their opponents and use rigged trials to kill them. The Athenian amnesty, however, held. Uh, it did hold. Uh, not perfectly. If you look at texts 2, 3, and 4, you'll see the evidence. It did not hold perfectly because we still find people using events, bless you, uh, under the oligarchy to prejudice juries against their opponents. But it did hold in that we don't find people formally charged with offences and even sources which are unfavourable to the democracy talk very favourably about the outcome. Uh, I stress text 4 in this context because the writer is someone who was uh, very unfriendly towards democracy as a system. The Athenians did, however, have very good reason to make this amnesty work. They had experienced another coup seven years earlier in 411 BC. That coup too had failed, but the Athenians took steps to exclude from political life people implicated in that coup and it seems that many people simply shunned public life uh, and out of fear of collective hostility. 
Text five is uh, an interesting literary text. It's a plea from, for, for forgiveness in a comic writer. Uh, and it's one of a number of texts which indicate that the Athenians were not minded in 411 uh, to give up on the past. The residual um, resentment probably drove many people into the arms of the oligarchs and helped to uh, create a basis for the later coup. The Athenians then in 403 had learned the lesson and they, implied, uh, they applied the lesson with the general amnesty. The other reason for leniency this time was that the 30 took steps to implicate as many people as possible in the regime. Uh, there were too many people tainted in one way or another with the regime, as for instance in East Germany after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, amnesty was far and away the safest course if one wanted to uh, create a world worth living in. I skip my other examples because I'm aware that I'm running uh, a little out of time. Uh, my conclusion is not a very profound one. Uh, as I said, no one is going to hang you uh, uh, in a humanities context uh, for uh, arguing that history may be quite a useful thing to know. My area of research is chronologically remote from the present. But the needs and problems, the successes and failures, are familiar in the world we live in. The need to cope with the trauma of civil war or oppression is a constant in human history because civil war and oppression recur. Sometimes the people that we study get it right. Sometimes they get it spectacularly wrong. Either way, they have something to tell us. And one could replicate the features uh, I've, I've indicated here across the whole piece of humanity's research. We no longer live in a world where politicians care about the world of classical Greece, uh, uh, but the past matters, and this past, the past of ancient Greece, as much as any, especially, I think, because the Greeks were so good at articulating the problems that they encountered. There is, of course, attention in all of this. The past matters because it can illuminate. But the past cannot imprison us or else there is no progress. We cannot suppose that everything that can be done has been done. But if we simply dismiss past experience, we enfeeble the present culturally and we endanger it practically. The invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq in this millennium ignored the lessons of history, lessons which were staring the participants in the face. British failure in Mesopotamia after the First World War should have alerted Tony Blair and George W. Bush uh, uh, against uh, uh, of the dangers of simply blundering into Iraq without thinking through the consequences. Afghanistan had proved intractable to the British in the 19th century and to the Russians in the 20th. Ignorance of regional history can be catastrophic in its consequences. You cannot pretend that the past didn't happen because it shapes present perceptions and identities for good or ill. George Santayana famously said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. In various forms, the quotation and misquotation has become a cliché. But clichés are clichés for a reason. They're telling us something. The danger of forgetting, I think, uh, is most familiar in the contemporary world in the persistence of Holocaust denial. The obvious answer is to argue that politicians need to consult historians, but they often do uh, when they choose. But they choose historians who tell them what they want to hear. The study of history itself is fissile. Modern politicians create a past which suits their needs, as we all do. This is not to dis dismiss the importance of history at the level of policy advice, because in foreign policy, regional history and regional studies are absolute, uh, absolutely critical. My point really is more about the value of historical research in the larger educational context. 
There is a wider role for history, and through it the teaching of history at schools and in universities, and equally important in the popular media where there is a hunger for historical topics. And this relates to the role of historical research in un uh, encouraging an open and critical engagement with the past. That is, in treating the past not as a series of facts or comforting platitudes or equally comforting myths or even a set of quasi-mathematical problems to which an answer can be found, but as a series of still open questions and encouraging a degree of skepticism towards the certainties which are offered in support of short-term solutions to complex problems. In this, history takes its place among the general contribution of the humanities and the sciences more generally in literally humanizing us and enhancing the capacity to think critically. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for this talk. Now, I have the pleasure to introduce the third speaker of this morning. This is Mariette Westerman. Uh, Mariette Westerman directs the Andrew Mellon Foundation's grant making and research programs. In 2014, she worked with the Institute of International Education to develop and launch the Artist Protection Fund, and previously, she was founding provost of New York University Abu Dhabi and director of New York University's Institute of Fine Arts. An art historian, she is the author of A Worldly Art, The Dutch Republic, 1585-1718, The Amusement of Jari Steen, Rembrandt Art and Ideas, Dutch, uh, rep, no, sorry, Rembrandt Art and Ideas and Anthropologies of Art. And no, she is writing a book on Dutch art, urbanism, conflict, and ideas in early global modernity. Please, Mayat, you are. Merci, Professor Tissot. Uh, bonjour, goeiemorgen, good morning. I hope you can all hear me. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, <laughs> good. And thank you to our language mediators. It's an incredibly impressive job you've been doing. I hope that I will, in these brief remarks, heed some of the extremely important and elegantly posed exhortations of the previous two speakers to look at the past uh, in ways that can be both critical and informative of our present and the world we seek to make. The document for a new humanities agenda that was drafted by the organizers of the World Humanities Conference recommends that the humanities should address concerns of the world outside the academy and root the revitalization of their disciplines in responsibility for managing the human and cultural complexity of our societies within a plurality of world cultures. That's a quotation of the document that's been circulated. To accomplish this goal of regrounding the humanities in the world, the organizers urge scholars to work with non-academic partners in the development and dissemination of such knowledge. These appeals which echo those heard in universities around the world today, these appeals appear to take the humanities scholar far from the idea of the universe, of the university, as a retreat from the world. Whether in Plato's Athens or medieval Nalanda in Northern India, the academy has historically demarcated space and time away from the world to enable deep reading, disinterested inquiry, robust discussion and sustained reflection. As universities grapple with pressures to cut costs and help solve the problems of global inequity and inequality, environmental depredations, xenophobia and bloodshed, it seems important for them not to lose this capacity for such, such temporary distancing that enables critical thought. At the same time, 
such retreats should be used intentionally to lead scholars and students back into the world with heightened abilities to address its problems and also to take joy in its marvels. The world is not all bad. The conference document recognizes this connection between thought and worldly action, noting that humanists should contribute to a more sustainable and inclusive world with the specific approach and competences of the humanities, including their unique dedication to a critical approach to values and the understanding of long-term processes. We've just heard two great examples of this, such work. The melon, oops, well, that's just the laser, okay. Uh, which is the forward one? Oh, you know what? It's the big green one. Makes yeah. sense. Good. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm good. Thank you. So the Mellon Foundation endorses this view, this view of the humanities both being very thoughtful and, and contributing to the world. We endorse this view because, as you can see from our mission statement, we exist to reinforce and defend the humanities and the arts as resources for human flourishing and for diverse and democratic societies. But can humanists really help solve global problems while maintaining critical distance from the messiness of the world? To test whether this contradiction can be resolved, let's look at two extreme challenges that are so intractable and that have grown so significantly in this century that it may seem crazy even to think about tackling them. The first problem is the massive destruction of cultural heritage in conflict zones. This infamous example you see here at Palmyra is only the most intentionally spectacular of attacks that are constant and wide-ranging and perpetrated by many actors all over the world and not just in the Middle East. So that's one problem we'll, we'll look at. The second is the crisis of refugees. Refugees defined as people who have entered sovereign states because they could not stay where they were and who have no immediate chances at obtaining legal rights in these new homes that are not really homes. Most refugees are essentially stateless, barely welcome in their host countries and reduced to a permanent state of legal precariousness. What can the humanities do about these big problems? if they don't command a police force or army to prevent attacks on cultural heritage, or if they don't have the power to control borders or grant asylum. Now, despite these obvious limitations of the humanist arsenal, I see great potential for the humanities to intervene in both situations for two reasons. First, these two challenges are closely connected and humanists have over time built the intellectual capacities and resources to make people see why and how these problems are connected. Second, we have promising proof that they can do so. Several humanities organizations and scholars have begun to address these two problems by involving affected communities through new partnerships of precisely the kind called for in the conference document, partnerships between universities and knowledge organizations and external communities. So let's take a look at these two problems as a sort of case study, whether the humanities can do good in the world and stay true to themselves. As the refugee crisis has erupted into view these past few years, we have all been reminded of the prescience of Hannah Arendt, who gave such an insightful phenomenological account of the political dynamics that make refugees stateless, thus depriving them of legal rights. I like this picture of her a lot, not only because she has that uh, long ash on the cigarette that reminds you of a different time, but also because we need women of this kind of fortitude today. Arendt used her philosophical training to diagnose her experience as a Jewish exile from Nazi Germany. She showed how statelessness denies human beings access to so-called universal human rights, as there is no state to which refugees can appeal to have those rights enforced unless they have asylum. 
While we often think of refugees as persecuted by their governments or caught in the crossfire of war, and many of them, of course, are, Iron's analysis in the origins of, the total of totalitarianism, Iron suggests there that many minorities are in a stateless or near stateless condition, even if they are not cast out of their countries yet. Undocumented immigrants in the United States, for example, or the 8,500 remaining Jews of Iran, live in similar situations of legal risk, often without safe options of either return or exile. Besides not having full legal rights, what many refugees and threatened minorities have in common is the perception on the part of majority populations that they pose some sort of threat a perception that is often encouraged by governments for political gain. Their very condition of being a refugee or less than a full citizen is presented as some kind of moral failing, the suggestion being that there must be something sort of wrong with these people to look and be like this. International human rights conventions, however admirable, offer no guarantees of protection to refugees unless they receive asylum. Arendt analyzed the effects of this situation, showing the problem to be that people who subsist without legal rights are not part of a political community. They may be, still be part of an ethnic or religious community, but they do not belong to a political community. And belonging to a political community means that you are able to act together with others to shape a society of laws, including the laws that lend you their protective force. Now, how is statelessness related to the problem of rampant attacks <coughs> on cultural heritage? Again, here the history of totalitarian states in Europe and what led to them is instructive. In Nazi Germany, policies of cultural deracination of Jews and deviants, from burning books to attacking degenerate art, served as prologue to denationalization and genocide. Many oppressive governments, really before, but especially since then, have targeted cultural heritage to define certain groups as, as ethnic or cultural aliens, and thus subject to legitimate violence from the state, whether it is the South African apartheid government attacking African languages, or the Khmer Rouge systematically destroying the arts in Cambodia. In the highly localized, near permanent warfare that has become endemic since the end of the Cold War, attacks on cultural heritage sites, such, such as here in Timbuktu and Mosul, attacks on cultural heritage sites, artifacts, languages, dress, and performance traditions have become battlefield tactics that position ethnic or religious groups as too alien to be acceptable in a particular society. The philosopher and legal scholar Mary Calder at the London School of Economics, Mary Calder has shown that what she calls these new wars are fundamentally different from the 19th century conception of formally declared wars between sovereign states. Wars that were conducted by professional armies that could, in theory, be held to the international law of war. Those old wars, while often exceedingly destructive of life and treasure, did come to declared ends. In the new wars, whether in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Ukraine, Syria, or Libya, multiple state and non-state actors vie for little pieces or big pieces of political and economic power in regions where the state is usually weak. These actors have complex interests in keeping armed conflict going, often having been victims of it in the first place. And that's why you see these conflicts drag on and on and on, and formal processes like ceasefires often not taking hold. These, con these conventional techniques of uh, international law, Mary Calder has shown, really don't work in this new complex setting. And in these new wars, factions use non-conventional weapons to delegitimize opposing groups, 
often using a crude identity politics to reshape conflicts that are political in nature and to reshape them then as fundamental clashes of religion or ethnicity. Such targeting of others helps maintain group loyalty and recruit others for the struggle. Warring parties in these settings strive to reserve the resources of the state for their own constituencies that are ethnically or religiously defined. And if they don't have those resources, they augment them by pillaging the property of others. Shared interests among people of different ethnicity or religion who were once peaceful neighbors are then quickly forgotten, as has been the case in Syria, Iraq, and Ukraine, and was of course true in the former uh, states of uh, the, the states making up the former Yugoslavia. The impoverishment and targeting of minorities or losing parties is often an intentional strategy to gain territorial control, hastening the forced displacement of these unwanted others. Attacks on cultural heritage go along with and encourage the debasement of competing groups and of course intimidate them into exile or submission. Contemporary perpetrators of cultural heritage destruction promote their success through video and social media. The spectacular destruction by ISIS of ancient temples, Muslim shrines, and pre-Islamic sculpture has supported the suppression of religious difference. The group publicly, ex public publicly executed Khaled al-Assad, the chief archaeologist of Palmyra, to signal what would befall, befall resistors, as he was. Analogously, the ruination of Assad's government, by Assad's government, of Sunni mosques and historic sites in Aleppo, supports, uh, supports the regime's uh, efforts to mark opponents as religiously incompatible with Syria's interests. These tax tactics have aggravated or even created divisions that were less pronounced or irrelevant before 2011. Big problems. How can humanists possibly ameliorate the situations of refugees, let alone protect their heritage in conflict zones? The examples of Arendt and Kaldor show that rigorous philosophy historical research and persuasive writing, they're both excellent writers, can help us understand how people come to perpetrate the most harrowing acts on members of their species. And Kaldor is a respected, influential voice in the international law arena, where she often testifies. This capacity of the humanities for historical and critical reflection through their work in the academy will have to be sustained. But there are also very practical examples of humanists who act on these insights to connect refugees to their new locales while keeping them connected to their cultural heritage. The example I will end with comes from Berlin, where they know why this is important. Here are uh, three, of the great, four, uh, three of the great Berlin mu museums, or four of them. It is hard to imagine that an active refugee engagement strategy might come out of the state museums of Berlin, out of buildings of such imposing quintessential imperialist and colonial form. But in 2015, these institutions reached into the Syrian and Iraqi refugee community around them to hire untrained guides who could provide tours in Arabic for fellow refugees. The program, named Multaka, which is Arabic for encounter, provides employment and training for two dozen refugees at a time, with the assistance of scholars from the Free University, who also help interpret the collections. The guides make the museum a meeting point for refugees to talk with each other about objects in the collections, and through them, about their own histories. Initially, Tours concentrated on works from the Middle East that provided obvious connecting points. And of course, these museums in Berlin have lots of these things from years of uh, getting them to, into their uh, museums, as you see here. But the first question someone asked in the training sessions is why this object 
the famous Ishtar Gate of Babylon was in Berlin. What was it doing there? Soon, as you can imagine, uh, the, 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 this, this program is very good for the museum as well. They're running humanities seminars over there. Soon the tours encompassed works on Christian themes, where refugees of different faith traditions discuss what their religions have in common and what issues have separated them, often only recently. The most popular tours are in the German Historical Museum, as newcomers want to understand the country, as newcomers want to understand the country and how Germany's decision to welcome them may be related to its history of totalitarian government, aggressive war, and anti-Semitic genocide. To date, almost 10,000 refugees have participated in Multaka, uh, and the museums are planning programs in German by popular demand, which will bring together refugees and long-standing citizens. The project has developed a new community interested in preserving its cultural heritage. Through the Multaka network, the museums are now involving many Syrians, both in Berlin and out, outside back in country, in gathering material for the Syrian Heritage Archive project. This is an online archive that combines the scholarly records of archeologists and historians with memories and documents contributed by participants from the public. The initiative collects testimonies, maps, photographs, and stories about places of cultural resonance. And it intends to make these available through an interactive heritage map that will be linked to these rich databases underneath. In conclusion, they won a big prize for the best sort of refugee engagement strategy in the country. And the country is quite proud of it. In conclusion, this Multaka experiment turns on its head the logic of attacking cultural heritage to sow division. The museums use their treasure house of diversity, of human diversity, as a resource that enables refugees and German citizens to recognize shared elements in their experience, or at least to find a way not to consider other communities completely abhorrent and deserving of their doom. So, I think our conference organizers, to whom we are all very grateful, may have it right. Humanities inquiry in the academy can be of the highest relevance to our social world. Humanists have at their, dispose, at their disposal the resources of political philosophy and oral history, traditions of writing and public engagement, collections of libraries and archives, and the communicative potentials of the arts to put the humanities to work on tough questions. The most precious resource of the humanities, however, are the students who march into our seminars and workshop every year and join our projects and online communities. Those refugee guides in Berlin, for the most part, are of that generation. Students want to work with us on solutions for what are, in the end, mostly their futures. They want us to do better. In the task of revitalizing the humanities, they are our best allies, and we cannot let their energies and commitments go to waste. Thank you. I introduce you now as the last speaker of this session, John Ayotunde Isola Bewayi, he is professor of philosophy at the University of West Indies in Kingston, in Jamaica, and is the author of several books, including The Rule of Law and Governance in Indigenous Yaruba Society, an essay in African philosophy. He has been an editor of publication, including the Caribbean Journal of Philosophy, and is the coordinator of the recent the Caribbean uh, Conference on Humanities, which took place last month in Kingston. I think yes, you have the floor, please. Um, thank you for that uh, introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me thank um, the UNESCO 
cluster for the Caribbean, especially Ms. Giselle Bobano, for all the efforts put into uh, bringing myself and Ms. Gonzalez here, and especially for hosting the um, Humanities uh, Symposium in Jamaica. Um, Okay, I'm just trying to see that um, it works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the background to my presentation is what has happened to humanities in contemporary society, especially in what I regard as um, societies of the South, uh, meaning Africa, Latin America, and the various other so-called third world societies. Uh, many of us will remember the clash of civilizations uh, predicted uh, by Huntington. The human diversity has always been with us and it's not going to go away. And as such, the only clash that we are experiencing and have always experienced has been the clash of greed. And it's assault on our collective humanity. And this clash uh, is intrinsic to what I regard as Arab Euro-American mind, because um, if we look historically at our humanity, there would always be differences, there would always be uh, disagreements, and there would always be um, quarrels. But those quarrels are always cloaked in some ideological or, in some instances, uh, fatalistic uh, uh, determinations. Contemporary society is faced with the danger of what I call homogenization and pasteurization of our humanity. And this disaster uh, that is waiting to happen at times is phrased uh, under the ages of multinational, uh, multilateral and international organizations, especially uh, when we bring together what we know as the United Nations Organization and the Security Council and the various other um, uh, what I call agents of multinationals. But human beings always reserve to themselves the right to a way of life, the way of being, that is their own way of being, and living on their own terms, that is using the uh, historically available resources and the memories and the ideas that they have always uh, put together. And that is why uh, people talk in various ways, describing various things in various uh, terminologies. Um, some people will talk about circumcision as uh, genital mutilation, uh, hijab, as uh, you know, in some derogatory terms, uh, the rasta use of herbs and liberty uh, in negative terms, and now uh, alternative lifestyles. So, uh, what does this then say to me? Um, it seems to suggest that. The tropes of um, our humanity in the form of science, technology, and the knowledge age now describes what we can call success or failure. It determines influence, determines wealth, and is supposed to be objective, universally, and applicable and freely accessible to all. 
But then, if we look around, in all the strictures that have been going on with the um, Northern um, Democratic Republic of Korea, and the old thing about weapons of mass destruction, it seems to suggest that there are only a few civilized human beings enough who can have weapons of mass destruction compared to the rest of us who are near barbarians, apes, and primitives who cannot be trusted with such sophisticated means of destruction. Uh, you know, the presentations by both the uh, speaker in the morning and my colleagues on the, at the table here seem to endorse uh, what I'm suggesting here. We all remember the axis of evil. They have not disappeared in spite of all efforts to destroy them. And in many instances, we also refuse to disappear. Now, other tropes are uh, in the form This thing seems to move so quick. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. So, um, what I was then trying to say is that our human sexuality and filial relationships have also gone through various uh, stages and discussions over time. Uh, heterosexuality, homosexuality, monogamy, uh, polyandry, polyamory, uh, homophobia, pedophilia, misogyny, sexism, and uh, various notions of family, uh, nuclear, extended, communal, and the various value systems that surround their description. But then, if we, if we look then at, uh, let me go on to the next one, which is religion. When we talk about religion, it is a case of Christianity, Islam, and the rest of our humanity. Many people talk today about uh, jihads and those things. We forgot about the Crusades. And we also seem to forget that um, if we look very carefully, it was Islam and the Moors who actually took civilization back to Europe. And consequently, our, the humanities and our humanity at times refuse uh, to be subsumed within the paradigms that are set for it. Now, let me talk a little bit about uh, Boko Haram in my country, Nigeria. I find it very ironic that these are a group of people who claim that they hate everything Western education. However, you find them carrying out their destructive activities, riding around in Japanese Hilux uh, Toyota vehicles using AK-47 built through the process of education and civilization, using cell phones to communicate. And I say to myself, if indeed uh, Boko Haram is, is a genuine uh, means of actually perpetuating a way of life, why do they need all these uh, things to conduct uh, their wars? And I ask, when they say holy wars, I ask whether it is actually holy or unholy. But then I come to the uh, feeling that the whole thing is about resource control. It's about mind control. It's about power. And it's all always uh, a, fun a function of deception. Um, it's a function of um, interests and it's a function of use of people and of ideas. And for that, I say that we are not in any uh, thing about any clash that is based on any ideas or technology. 
And now we, we face a new situation where we talk about making America great again. I hope we all, you know, uh, probably in Europe that doesn't resonate, but being at the backyard of America, when America begins to sneeze, uh, we in Jamaica, we catch cold. Um, if you make America great again, and Europe for Europeans, then what happens to Africa and the rest of us? Um, we are now facing a new scramble for Africa. Uh, a new Berlin conference is taking place. Just, uh, the other, just last week, China established its uh, um, outposts in Djibouti. Uh, you know, building a base there. America has its own base there. All of them have their bases. And France has refused to let any of the colonies, ex-colonies in Africa, have a central bank. They all bank in, 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 in France. So if you, if you begin to look at all of this, then the issue is, what do we do? Now, the, the problem is that it's not as if most of us from the so-called third world societies don't understand what we need to do. Especially, let me take education. We know that education begins right from conception. And we know that you can begin building a viable uh, humanity right from there. And we know that early childhood education is very critical. However, when your society is impoverished or indebted, you know what to do, but you can't do it. And those who are going to be lending you money or giving you aids or grants, they make sure that you don't apply it to where it is necessary. And therefore, what do you have? You are unable to perpetuate your own way of life. You are unable to tell your own story. And if somebody is telling your story for you, automatically the person gets to tell the story the way he likes it. And because of that, we find that the humanities is, you know, now it is a question of STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and so on. But then, people forget that any of them is not uh, in vacuum. It is constructed by society and by human beings, and there is no neutrality in any of this. And consequently, what do we do? Those of us at the margins who probably don't even exist, what do we do? How do we tell our stories in the age of uh, ICT when all the technologies are bombarding you with all kinds of images and ideas globally and you have no means of control of the consumption of ideas that you're exposed to. So, I end with a question. Humanities to the rescue, is that not too late? Thank you. <laughs>